First, I'd like to thank organizers for inviting me to this uh, really great conference. And uh, in this occasion, I'd like to talk about the uh, application of the idea of quantum entanglement to local operators. So how can we describe some degree of freedom of a given local operator by looking at quantum entanglement? And this talk is based on these papers and uh, collaboration with the uh, Powell Kafta and Song He, who is a, uh, was a postdoc in YITP, and Masanori Nozaki and Tokiro Numasawa and Kento Atanabe, they are graduate students in our institute. So let me begin with the introductions. In the quantum field theory, this entanglement entropy, which I just call EE, provides us a universal physical quantity. And uh, in a condensed matter context, it's, we can regard this as some nice quantum order parameter. And for example, we can characterize the degree of freedom of a given conformal field theory from the entanglement entropy. Especially, it's, this quantity is directly related to central charge, as it's typical in a even dimensional compound field theory. In 2D CFT, it's proportional central charge C. And 3D, uh, for the conformal field theory, it's also logarithmic term. We forget about this linear, uh, uh, sorry, leading area of time. That's the logarithmic term. The coefficient is directly related to central charge called A. And even in other dimensional conformal field theory, there are no central charge, but we can pick up this finite quantity just to get rid of this area of divergence. And this precisely agree with what people call F. And indeed, uh, by using the, uh, as in uh, Horatio's talk, yesterday so we can prove this F theorem, with F is uh, monotonically decreasing on the energy flow by looking at the strong subjectivity of entanglement entropy. So this entanglement entropy is quite useful quantity to this extract some degree of freedom of a conformal field theory and especially looking at the ground state. So, but at the same time, I'd like to also uh, say that it's also there are another interesting series of quantities called Rainy entropy, Rainy entanglement entropy, which is this defined by this formula. So this is actually, uh, we use this formula in a replica method, and if we take n goes to one limit, we have, we just recover this von Neumann entropy, which is just entanglement entropy. But this is, so in that sense, it's some one parameter generalization of this entanglement entropy. This is called Rainier entanglement entropy. And this is the main quantity which I'd like to uh, focus on in this talk. So if we know all of this Rainier entropy for any n, in principle, we, we, we can say that we know all eigenvalues of this reduced density matrix by di diagonalization. And this is recently called uh, the entanglement spectrum and there are lots of works in condensed matter literature these days. So on the other hand, this is a story in a quantum field theory or a quantum many-body systems, but on the other hand, if we look, talk about gravity, this idea of quantum entanglement has played also a very crucial role. And this is the reason that this suggests that uh, this quantum entanglement actually gives us some, uh, uh, I mean, structure of space-time. Actually, space-time can be uh, regarded as some collection of lots of quantum bits and small bits, and it uh, corresponds to the Planck unit. And this is, first of all, this is clear uh, and it's suggested, strongly suggested in the context of famous uh, Bekenstein Hawking black hole entropy, so if it's the area of formula. And this says that this one bit corresponds to one Planck unit. So if you have some Planck unit zero, then there is some one bit is hidden there. But this is a very special case because this is a black hole, but then we can generalize this by looking at this holographic entanglement entropy. So there we can actually, in a rather generic side, but still we need to uh, take some minimal area surface, but we can generalize this idea to rather generic space time in, and so that it's associated with some counting number of quantum bits in a dual theory. And so, also, so we can, from this idea, so we can say that we have this uh, holography, so we have some boundary and it's a bulk geometry, and we have a lot, this uh, minimal surface, but we can sweep this minimal surface everywhere. So that means that uh, each, each, this uh, Planck unit uh, cell, we have some one entangling bond. So this means that uh, uh, space time is somehow uh, and consists of this um, bonds in the uh, quantum bit in the, uh, this uh, bulk space time. And this leads to the idea of this relation between quantum entanglement and gravity. And this is talked also by, related to talk by this Ramsdon yesterday. And uh, so one concrete uh, realization of this idea is looking at so-called MERA, which is a multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz, which is, or uh, it is called entanglement renormalization. I don't have time to explain details, but roughly speaking, we have some spin, spin system. We can start with spin system, it's cost grain, but at the same time, we uh, somehow do this uh, unitary transformation, each step so that it's cut it down or increasing the amount of entanglement. This is called entangler. So this, uh, by looking at this structure, so uh, space time, these are some one dimension higher 
dimensional space time because there is just, uh, this coarse graining direction, which is the extra dimension. And the claim is that made by this uh, uh, swinger is that this space time may be looking at this anti Doshita space. In exactly this mechanism similar to the same as this ADS CFT correspondence. And indeed, there are some quantum bits that consist of space time. And if we look at entanglement entropy between a region A and the other part, so we are actually, this, uh, we have similar, exactly say, similar this, uh, minimal surface construction, just minimal number of these counting bonds. So this structure precisely corresponds to this way, at least qualitative level. So it's a quite nice correspondence, and this suggests this uh, a quantum entanglement, idea of quantum entanglement is quite useful to understand quantum gravity. So, but in this talk, I'd like to also mention that, so previously I talked about this entanglement entropy for ground state, which is related to central charge and so on, but I'm more interested in, in this talk, that uh, we can look at this excited state, and rather than ground state, then uh, actually entanglement entropy also useful quantity to characterize excited state. So, we we'll study the example, uh, the uh, uh, quantum quenches, uh, already we had a talk by Hong Liu, and, uh, so there are, for example, the most simplest cases called, an important case is called global quantum quench, which is <laughs> so like this. And it's like just a homogeneous excitation by changing some mass parameter, for example, some par par parameter in the Hamiltonian. In that case, we find some linear growth of entanglement entropy. And in a more complicated case, but we can just locally excite the system. So, for example, we can consider some semi-infinite line or a spin chain and attached to with each other at some time, just instantly. Then we, can have, we have some local excitation. In that case, uh, this collaborative Cardi computed this time evolution in a 2D conformal You say it's like C, C is central charge times log T, it's a log growth we have. But in this talk, actually, I want to focus on the more elementary excited state, which is just given by the excitation by single local operator. So in other words, in this context of time evolution, we would like to, at some particular time, instantly we want to insert some local operator, and I would like to ask how is the uh, time evolution of this entanglement entropy. This is the main aim of this talk. And we would like to consider, so this uh, excited state described just this vacuum acted by this uh, local operator OX, and in conformal theory, maybe we can choose this primary operator, which has a better property. And we are interested in the quantity delta S n. This is the main quantity which we discuss in this talk. So this delta S is actually just this difference. And uh, so this is uh, a Rényi entropy for this excited state, locally excited state, minus this Rényi entropy for ground state. So this is uh, guaranteed to be finite. So this is a good quantity to look at. And uh, we'd like to claim that, anyway, so this is the entropy. So this counts some loss of information. when. We, if we assume this region B is in, invisible and delta S means this difference, if we add some local operator, so roughly speaking, we'd like to say that this somehow delta S A actually somehow counts a degree of freedom of the operator itself rather than the theory itself. So if you look at this, the S for this uh, grand state, we can read off this uh, degree of freedom of theory or conformal theory, but here we take uh, this difference. So this delta S A should be related to degree of freedom of the operator. So, and I'd like to explain their limits, which we'd like to take. So, first limit is something called first law of entanglement entropy. This is uh, exactly related to this uh, uh, Mar Ramsdong's talk yesterday. But uh, this is uh, like L goes to zero limit. This L is the size of subsystem. And if we take L subsystem size goes to zero, or in other words, this means small energy limit so that everything can be treated perturbation. So in that case, delta SA is proportional to the delta A, so especially this n equal one case, so it's quite established. That case is actually related to energy density or total energy. So this is, in our purpose, it's, it's somehow just related to energy, so we don't, we are not so much interested in this case. We are really interested in very entropic case, and the, where the quantity delta S is not directly related to any um, energy. So this is the opposite limit, L goes to zero, infinite limit, that's a very large size limit. Subsystem size goes to infinity. So that's a large energy limit, in other words. So this is the main purpose of this talk. How can we compute this quantity? What is the behavior of this quantity? So this is the contents of my talk is like this. So we just finished the introduction, and the next I just give some 
explain how to compute this uh, delta S, especially using replica method. It's a rather elementary method, but uh, in the end we find it's related to correlation functions. And then we, we discuss three different cases. First one, free scalar field theory in any dimension, higher dimension also included, and rational to the conformal field theory. And finally, I'd like to uh, explain the result for large CFT and ADS relation to ADS CFT correspondence, holographic results. So this replica calculation, this is something rather, uh, we just follow the standard way of replica calculation, replica method. So we want to compute this quantity. So this is a, a lenient, lenient entropy. We take derivative of n and take n goes to one. So this is a von Neumann entropy. But first we just compute this trace a to the rho, to rho a to the n's for any integer of n and take analytical continuation about n and take this derivative. <laughs> In the path integral formalism, ground state wave function is just a ground. The okay, state is described by just path integral from minus infinity. This is a Euclidean time from minus plus infinity. So we just are uh, interested in this low A, which is a reduced density matrix. So psi, this, psi is a, this state is a ground, st ground state or excited state we are looking at, but here we assume ground state. So this is a ground state of conformal field theory, and it's like a, it's a pure state density matrix and project it over this B. So we trace out region B. And this, this corresponds to this one. So we have some two vector, which is one side and the other side, and paste with each other along B. And there is an argument about Hilbert space or HA, A, A region, and this opens up. There's a two boundary condition corresponding to this argument of this matrix, reduced density matrix. Then we take compute this trace row A to the Ns, and this corresponds to this uh, just uh, Pasting with uh, pasting procedure, we uh, identify this up lower cut with upper cut of the second seat, and because we have a row A to the n, so we have an n copy of this. This is replicas, and replicas, and we paste with each other. In the final, we identify this one with first one, and in the end, we have a, a, a manifold without a boundary. So this is an seated Riemann, Riemann surface, which is we have some cut around this. If we go around this cut, we have second seat and third seat and so on. And it's written in terms of partition function on this manifold, divided by some vacuum partition function as a normalization. So now, but we are in, this is a well-known uh, result for this uh, well-known calculation for ground state of entanglement entropy, but we want to compute entanglement entropy for excited state. So we, we have, this is a replica method for excited state. So we want to compute trace row A ends anyway. So that, but the row A here, we are taking this form. So as already explained, we have vacuum and we act to this local operator and we have some time evolution, just IHT, standard time evolution, but we put some UV regularization, which is given by exponential epsilon times H. H is a Hamiltonian and epsilon is a very small quantity which gives uh, UV regulator. And in the end, we take epsilon goes to zero in the final calculations. So uh, and we can regard this as some uh, time shifted operator like this tau E and X and epsilon minus it. So this is somehow we start with the Euclidean formulation. We we'll compute everything in a Euclidean uh, replica method, but uh, in the end we do this analytical continuation about Euclidean time to this minus it. This uh, looks like complex, but this is some method to compute. This uh, corresponds to retarded some green function. This is quite a standard uh, analytical continuation. So here we consider d, d plus one dimensional conformal field theory on the R d plus one. So we have some Euclidean time and x one are the other coordinate. So we combine these two coordinates, first two coordinates into this complex coordinate and the polar coordinate. So then what we find is that just uh, these replicas, there are n replicas, but we, uh, we insert this operator and operator, this is a bura and the ket, we have two operators and each sheet has a two operator. So totally we have two n operator inserted, so it's a two n point function like this. So essentially even though entanglement entropy originally it's a bit complicated quantity, but it just reduced to this calculation of two n function. But uh, uh, the point is that we are not the uh, flat space, but the n-seated surface, which in general, this calculation is quite hard, except two dimension. So first case is the simplest case, which is where we'd like to compute this in a free field case, free master scalar field, so del phi, del phi. And that case, we know the uh, green function exactly. And uh, so this case, free master scalar case, we can choose this operator, which we're looking at, excited op for, used for excitation, to be just the scalar field times uh, to the case, some k power, just by the k such phi fields. So if we choose this way, what happens? So, but we, we have some exact analysis because this is an exactly solvable model. So this first thing we, we should look at. 
And then this is a, for example, if we choose a simplest operator, O is just a linear operator, phi, just phi. Then we have this behavior. In 2D, this is not the primary field, we just use this exponential i phi, actually. But this doesn't change so much. And in 2D, it's like step function. And in higher dimension, we have a, some smoothness, smooth, some smooth increasement of entanglement. This is a time, time evolution, and this is a delta s. We are especially looking at delta s a too, but it's a similar thing also happens in other n. And th this kind of prop property very easy to understand in the, in the just causal propagation. We insight operator some here, here. So this is a space, space and the time direction is with the orthogonal. So at some time, we insert this operator here. That creates entangled pair. This creates up spin and down spin, it's entangled, roughly speaking. And they, but this is a, mass, a massless scalar fuel theory, conformal fuel theory. They, yes, they propagate the speed of light in the left and right. So at a later time, when this, this uh, we define this widths is L, small L, then T larger than L, one, one excitation goes to the region A, and the other is always B, so it starts to entangle. So entanglement becomes non-trivial. So at T equal L, it starts increasing, but in 2D, everything is just one line, so everything trivial, just shift at this point, but in a higher dimension, we have a many different propagation. It takes a longer time than L, so it's a gradual increasing that way. At another interesting point is that this quantity is topologic, it's kind of topological invariant, so that we can modify this boundary in any waves, wavy shape. So this, uh, this increasement is slightly changed, but final value stays the same. So final value is the invariant under this, some, uh, some deformation of this region A. So in this particular case, we get log 2, uh, 0 0.6 something, so it's like actually log 2. But in other case, we have some more different quantity. So we have some log 2 in particular case. This means that this state is EPR state, but more general case, it's like more f general fractional number. And we can actually speculate the result, and recently the exact proof by, of this result by looking at this empirical method by this Nozaki's paper. So now we'd like to understand this result. But this is not so difficult, at least heuristical level. So we have a left, in, even in higher dimension, we can just roughly call this, uh, we create excitation here, but it's like left moving and right moving. So we divide the composed scalar field left moving and right moving, and it's a uh, phi to k is power, it's like, this, we have some, this is a binomial coefficient. We just take a k, k power of this. So then we have this, and we just talk about entanglement between left side and right side. This is correspond to left moving sector time and right moving sector. We are talking about entanglement between these two different sectors. So then, indeed, because of this binomial coefficient, we get this result. This is any entropy, and we can take n goes to one limit. This is entanglement entropy. This precisely explains our result for replica method. So we can compute this with a particular k and n. k is operator k, and n is a replica number, but it's always precisely agree with that. So this is a, a free field case. And we can promote this as a more interacting case, but still solvable case. The good example is a rational 2D conformal field theory. So this is a trivial example of free scalar. So we have an exponential operator, entropy is zero, but we have some cosine operator, like exponential alpha, alpha phi, we have log two because this is a direct product state in terms of left moving and right moving. It's just phi L times phi R. This is a direct product, that means no entanglement. But this cosine operator is like a, actually EPR state because we have a ups, a plus sign, plus sign, and negative, negative. It's left moving, it's completely entangled. So we get log two here. So, but we want to go to the a more non-trivial case, which is a rational cohort few theory, including uh, minimal models and so on. So, so that case actually, so we can compute this correlation functions. Um, so that case, let's take n equal to linear entropy. That's a four-point function, essentially correlation of four-point function. And it, in terms of up to some kinetical factor, we can return everything in terms of cross ratio of these four points. So this interesting thing happens for cross ratio. And if we take this uh, uh, epsilon goes to zero, and uh, we have some non-trivial time t equal l when this created entanglement approaches this point. So at the trivial time, this early time, everything goes to trivial. Z and Z bar cross ratio goes to zero always. So this are not just entropy is zero. But later time, if we, this entangled pair, one of the pairs crosses this border, then actually Z, Z bar actually goes to one Z. So maybe you might think it's strange because it's complex quantity, but it's not complex quantity. But this is fine. We are taking this uh, funny analytical continuation, but it's corresponding to retarded 
green function. But anyway, we have one D. This is a very important point. Uh, so Z bar, right moving mode doesn't change, but left, only left moving part changes. This means that we do some chiral transformation, chiral fusion transformation. Z goes to one over Z. So then we can have a nice story, and we are talking about this four point function and it, uh, summing over each conformal blocks, and we do this fusion transformation. There's a nice formula, known, well known formula for this. It's related to this S channel and T channel, and in, in terms of linear transformation. And in the end, what we find is that just final quantity just written in terms of this constant, so called fusion matrix. So this is linear entropy increment, just log of my, minus log F. And F is the inverse of quantity, more interesting quantity, so called quantum dimension. Yes. Quantum dimension is just a little in terms of the S matrix, but this is sort of some degree of freedom of this, uh, so, sort of some degree of freedom of the given operator. So in this way, we find that delta SA second linear entropy is log, log of this quantum dimension. And this, we can just generalize this proof for any n. I don't have time to do this. But this is some very simple, but some profound result. If you look at the Ising model, we have some three conformal block identity spin and energy operator. And because of this fusion rule, and we have a sigma, if you multiply this spin operator to n times, then we get this one. This conformal block, and it's like there are two n particles. We start with two, uh, sorry, it, we start with this two n, but in the end, two two n particles. This means that it, if we take average, this one sigma corresponds to root of two particles. This looks funny, but it's anyway, this is a definition of quantum dimension, and this roughly counts the number of degree of freedom of, of this operator. In this entanglement, entropy precisely gives log square root of two, so it's a half of EPR pair. Okay, so I, I just go to the final topic, which is large and CFT. And so first example is a free UN super amuse. But actually, we're just looking at this free scalar field theory with adjoint value, with adjoint matrix values, we trace phi to the Js. This is some family operator in ADS CFT, like chiral prime operator. <laughs> so then we can compute this entanglement to be gross in the same way as we did before. Then we have something interesting. We have two terms. One is just reading term, another term is sub-reading about one over n, one over n expansion. But uh, this becomes, actually domin uh, actually gives an uh, important contribution, or the one contribution, if we take n goes to one limit. So the result is something interesting. So or, if we look at the uh, linear entropy, always we have order one quantity, j times some log two. But uh, if we look at n equal one limit, von Neumann entropy limit, then there are enhancement of degree of freedom. It's log n. We have log n degree of freedom. Because of the second term, it's uh, originally subreading, but it becomes reading. So that, this can be easily understood because there are, if we expand this left and right moving in terms of this uh, indices, there are some sort of EPR state between with a n square degree of freedom, as it's clear from these indices. So this is very natural, but in a linear entropy, you have just order one quantity. So this is some kind of, decon I, I'm not sure, but it's kind of deconfinement transition for we exit. Finally, I just uh, write this uh, holographic result on the other hand. So that case is strongly coupled series. So this previous result is a weakly coupled series. It's totally different. So that case, we, under some approximation, geodesic approximation, we find some logarithmic growth about time evolution. And it's always proportional to conformal dimension. This is true for Rainy entropy. And n goes, if we take n goes to one limit, which is a, uh, n, goes to, yes. n goes to one limit is a von Neumann entropy limit, this breaks down because this is divergent. Indeed, this approximation just breaks down in this limit, but if we don't take this limit, we have this formula. It's proportional to the dimension of conformal, conformal dimension of this uh, excited operator. But if we take n goes one limit, we need another method because this method is quite hard. So we just use, this case, we just use holographic entanglement entropy formula. Here, we just use a holographic correlation function method, but here, we use holographic entanglement entropy. Then we get delta S n equal one for Neumann entropy. It's now C times log T. It's much like local quench result, but it's coefficient slightly different. But this now C appears like, like previous way. So here, uh, uh, linear entropy, we don't have N here, but the degree of freedom appears for, for Neumann entropy. Something similar also true in holographic calculations. Here, no, nothing central charge, just dimension or conformal dimension appears. Okay, so it's now time, so let me summarize the conclusion of this my talk. So in the large, uh, so we take a large size limit of subsystem A, and this linear entropy for a locally excited state, we compute it, and then somehow it describes some degree of freedom of the given local operator. So, and behind this kind of properties, 
especially, uh, so in 2D, it's a like quantum dimension, but in the large in CFT, we have some interesting phenomena which, which shows that only n equal one limit actually gives some different result, actually enhanced entropy. So, so the one lesson which we can draw from this talk is that Rayleigh entropy and the Neumann entropy usually think it's something similar, and uh, some we just take some limit to the Neumann entropy, but actually they sometimes behave differently. So this corresponds to low temperature and the other one high temperature. And maybe this may be the reason, reason, maybe this re related to the reason why in gravity, in some entanglement, holographic formula for Neumann entropy is easy to find, but the Rayleigh entropy is quite hard. So I, I, I think it's good. The interesting, uh, interesting thing to, to understand this kind of issues uh, in, in your future. Thank you very much. <laughs>